Tides of War by Stephen Pressfield. And you can see the subtitle here, A Novel of Alcibiades and the Peloponnesian War. So this is a historical novel about Alcibiades and the Peloponnesian War. So what is the Peloponnesian War? Well, let's go to this book, The Peloponnesian War by Donald Kagan, which I read last year and reviewed on this channel. And uh, in the description down below, I'll link to my review of this book if you're interested. In my review of this book, which I, I did about a year ago, I uh, mentioned that this was the first book I've read on the Peloponnesian War, but it's something I've been interested in for a long time, you know, watching the, the, the normal stuff, reading about it on Wikipedia, listening to podcasts, watching YouTube videos. So I, I've been kind of biting around the edges for a bit before I read this book. But this, this so far is the first, and, uh, the first book I read in the Peloponnesian War. And this is the second book. So I've only read two books on it. So I don't want to call myself an expert, but I, I do believe that this period in history can be quite interesting for several reasons, which is why when I saw this historical novel about the Peloponnesian War, I was quite keen to pick it up. Now, in my review of uh, the Peloponnesian War by Donald Kagan, which I did last year, I spent a long time talking about why this period in history is so potentially interesting. And I don't want to repeat all that again. On the other hand, I, I do want to set up why I was interested in reading this book. So maybe I'll just try and do the quick version of this, the, the five minute version. The, the video I did last year, I, I rambled on for like 30 minutes uh, about it, but I'll, I'll try and do the, the five minute version about why the Peloponnesian War is interesting. Uh, and also why the Peloponnesian War is confusing. Uh, uh, maybe I'll start with the confusing part p first. So the Peloponnesian War was a war between Athens and Sparta. It was all, it, somewhat like the Napoleonic Wars. It was actually a series of wars with an uneasy peace in between. Uh, it's confusing because it goes on for like 30 years uh, with various different stages in between. Uh, and it's also confusing because uh, it's not just Athens versus Sparta. It's the whole Athenian Empire versus the whole Spartan Empire. Uh, and much like the Cold War in the U.S., uh, sorry, the Cold War in the 20th century with the U.S. and Russia, uh, they're fighting a lot of these proxy battles. So they're not actually, uh, Athens and Sparta are not meeting each other on the battlefield directly so much as uh, going to all these different cities and having proxy wars over there. Uh, and the Peloponnesian War goes all over. It all goes up and down the Greek Peninsula. Uh, they go over to Italy for a bit. There's a Sicilian chapter in it. Uh, the Persia gets involved at one point. Carthage gets involved at one point. E Egypt is uh, tangentially involved at one point. Uh, so it, it's... Um, it, Lots of players, lots of geography, lots of time periods. It can get really confusing. But it can also be really interesting. Uh, so like I mentioned, uh, in the 20th century, a lot of people have found analogs between this and the Cold War. And it, uh, it was quite popular to study the Peloponnesian War during the height of the Cold War because people thought they saw historical analogs. Not only because it was two great empires who were fighting each other with kind of proxy battles and trying to win over allies, uh, but also because there was an ideological component to it, uh, much like there was an ideological component in the 20th century Cold War. Uh, democracies were by and large aligned with Athens. Oligarchies were by and large aligned with Sparta, although there were some exceptions to this, much like the 20th century Cold War. Uh, sometimes Athens would attack a democracy if they thought they could get a geopolitical advantage by controlling that territory. Uh, but um, the, the other uh, an analogy to the Cold War is there's an interesting question in the Peloponnesian War about the cost of war versus the cost of an unstable peace. So if you've got two giant empires who are probably going to come to war sooner or later, how much do you want to try and preserve the peace or how much do you want to 
jump into the war uh, when it's advantageous for you. Uh, and if you do jump into the war, then have you calculated correctly uh, what the costs are going to be? That's, that's one of the questions that uh, most interests Donald Kagan, the, the author of this book. But the other thing that I uh, hinted at before is that this is a period in uh, Athenian history where they're at their most radical in terms of uh, democratic ideals. And we, or at least sometimes I, I think, speaking for myself, tend to sometimes forget uh, about all the radical ideas in, in ancient history. You know, you, you think, well, democracy, that didn't really come around to the French Revolution. But the Athenians uh, very strongly believed in democracy. Uh, and in fact, their form of democracy was um, much more radical than ours is, as, as Donald Kagan makes a point, not in this book, but in his uh, lectures, uh, the, the Yale Open Courses series, which you can watch on YouTube. He said the Athenians would not have recognized the United States as an authentic democracy because we don't actually make the decisions ourselves. We elect leaders and then they, they make decisions and then they inform us about it after they've made all the decisions. But uh, at, at the height of uh, the radical democratic period in Athens, they were voting on everything. They were voting on the military campaigns and what to do with the prisoners and you know any issue that came forth, it was getting voted on. Uh, but this was also a period of uh, ideological conflict and class conflict in Athens because not everyone liked the democracy. Uh, the oligarchs didn't like the democracy. They thought they should be in charge and not the, uh, the, the lower class people. So at one point in the Peloponnesian War, there is an oligarchic coup in Athens, and then democracy is restored later. So it, it's an um, interesting period in, in terms of uh, the, the radical politics of the period, but... Uh, it also is uh, illustrative of the contradiction maybe between democracy and empire, because even though Athens was at its most democratic during this time, they were also running a very uh, oppressive empire in which they were subjugating other Greek city-states to them. And in fact, the Spartans were fighting their part in the Penelope Peloponnesian War uh, and able to uh, under the banner of freeing the Greeks uh, from the tyranny of the uh, Athenians. Uh, and uh, people like Noam Chomsky have drawn parallels to the United States empire, where the United States has a, a very free internal society, but still maintains an oppressive external empire, uh, much like in the case of Athens. Uh, as the Peloponnesian War dragged on, uh, well, sorry, let me back up. The other interesting thing about the Peloponnesian War is it took place right smack dab in the middle of the golden age of uh, Greek culture. So Socrates was fighting in the Peloponnesian War. Plato was alive back then. A lot of the famous Greek plays uh, were written during that time. And the Peloponnesian War was influencing all that. Influenced the life of Socrates, influenced the life of Plato. And the other thing uh, is with all this literature being written during this time, uh, and as the war dragged on and became very oppressive and bloody and cruel, there were some anti-war plays being written during this time, like Trojan Women or Lysistrata. Uh, and these plays have become popular recently, again in the 20th century, like during the Vietnam War, uh, the, the, the plays Trojan Women and Lysistrata had a renewed popularity because of their anti-war themes and themes about the suffering of war. So, for all those in reasons, uh, it can be a very fascinating, but also very complicated and frustrating period of history to study. But I was definitely up for learning more of that. Uh, my, my interest was was. I, I was interested in it. I wanted to learn more. So when I saw this book at Book Street here in Saigon, a, a used bookstore, I, I live out in Vietnam. So uh, getting English books is always touch and go. You, you, you can never get everything you want, but you just go to the used bookstores and you see what just happens to be left behind, uh, which makes it hard to follow niche interests. If I'd been living in the U.S., I, I probably would have been able to follow my niche interests a little bit more closely. But 
I saw this, a, a novel about the Peloponnesian War, and I thought, well, I love historical fiction. I'm interested in the Peloponnesian War. Uh, great, great, and, and, and I, I bought this. Uh, it's by Stephen Pressfield, and I've not read any of his books before, although I'm slightly familiar with him by reputation. His most famous historical novel is The Gates of Fire, which is about the 300 Spartans uh, at Thermopylae. That, that, you know, that, yeah, you, you know the story, the 300 Spartans. Uh, I've not read it. I'm told it's very popular, and I'm, I, I believe it was Steve Donahue who said on his channel that it's particularly popular uh, with uh, military circles. So if you're on a military base, uh, Steve Donahue said you, you're almost certain to find a copy of Gates of Fire. I'll, I'll take his word for it. Um, I don't really know much about Stephen Pressfield's uh, politics, although I, when, recent, when reading reviews of this book on Amazon and Goodread, I did hear some people say he was uh, like a right-wing military nut. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, it could, that could be true, or maybe people are just as, assuming that because Gates of Fire is so popular, apparently, with military people. Uh, one, one reviewer I read, I forget if this was on Goodreads or Amazon, said that the premise of the book was a little bit flawed because it was supposed to be a novel about Athens, but it was made by a guy who was obviously more sympathetic to Sparta. I... You can see that in certain passages of this book, where uh, Spartan, Athens is portrayed as kind of a little bit of a mess. Sparta is portrayed as authoritarian, but with uh, very admirable virtues. Uh, and the, the Athenians, a lot of the Athenians in this book can't help but admire Sparta. Uh, whereas the Spartans um, do not reciprocate that. So it's, it's you, you could definitely get the impression from this book of a thought, flawed Athens and a glorious Sparta. Um, it, it's, it's not, it's not, it's a, it's a loving look at Athens. It's a sympathetic look at Athens, but it's, it's a, it's a look that definitely portrays Athens as very messy uh, and Sparta, there's a lot of admiration for Sparta in here. So I, I can see where there, those reviewers are coming from. I don't know. I don't know. Okay, so moving on. Uh, now, in particular, the novel is about Alcibiades. I, I've also heard this pronounced as Alcibiades. I, I don't know. Um, but yeah, Alcibiades is an interesting guy. He uh, figures prominently in Donald Kagan's book. Although the first time I heard of him was on a YouTube video by Overly Sarcastic Productions, uh, which they make a 17-minute video just talking about what a, a comedy the story of Alcibiades is. Uh, they pronounce it as Alcibiades in their video. So the, the guy had a very interesting life, which you could either spin as tragedy or comedy. So, right. Briefly then, uh, the story of Alcibiades. Uh, Alcibiades was the protege of Pericles. Pericles was paradoxically kind of the head of the radical democratic faction in Athens, but he was also the um, dominant personality in Athens for I, I don't know how many years, uh, like 30 or 40 years, and uh, was essentially like a de facto dictator of Athens just because of his cult of personality, even though he was uh, ostentatiously, is that the word, uh, promoting uh, democratic uh, politics. So uh, Alcibiades was his kinsman and protege. Alcibiades was also a uh, protege of Socrates, who was his teacher, and Alcibiades uh, shows up in several of Plato's dialogues as one of uh, Socrates' um, conversants, uh, people talking to Socrates. Uh, he was, uh, as uh, pointed out on the, the video by Overly Sarcastic Productions, he was incredibly charismatic and gorgeous, and everybody loved him. And it looked like he was going to... Uh, 
become the next Pericles or become the next dominant uh, force in Athens. But a lot of people also hated him. On the eve of the Sicilian ex expedition, which was mostly Alcibiades' idea, there was this bizarre scandal where the penises got knocked off a bunch of the statues in Athens. Uh, like I said, you could really play this as a comedy if you wanted to. To this day, nobody knows who did it, but uh, Alcibiades was known for having a raucous nightlife. So uh, either he and his buddies did it with, with an, a night of late night drinking, or it was pinned on him by his enemies. Either way, uh, it was an incredibly sacrilegious thing to do. So uh, he was uh, eventually condemned to death. He had to flee Athens and went to Sparta. Uh, and from Sparta, uh, he was actually working against Athens and giving the Spartans all sorts of advice on how to military, militarily defeat Athens. Uh, so complete 180 on his uh, radical democratic politics. And, and now he's all of a sudden uh, on the other side of the war. Uh, he was in Sparta for a few years until he wore out his welcome. There was a scandal with the wife of the Spartan king who gave birth to a baby that looked like Alcibiades. So Alcibiades then had to flee to Persia where he uh, charmed himself into the Persian court and gave the Persians advice on how to deal with the, the Athenians and the Spartans. Uh, then there was that oligarchic coup in Athens I talked about later, and uh, eventually Alcibiades came back to Athens where he was, uh, and for, for a while it looked like he was supporting the oligarchs, so that's another strange political turn. Uh, came back into Athens, everybody loved him again, they, they forgot why they had condemned him to death in the first place, uh, and then he was um, leading the Athenian war effort, uh, until uh, he had a, his, his star was going up, up, up until it wasn't. And then he had a couple defeats and then they soured on him in Athens again and he went into exile. So uh, overly sarcastic productions uh, does that whole story just as a comedy. And you, you can see there's a lot of comedic gold in there to be mined. There's also a lot of interesting personal drama in there. So when I saw a novel of Alcibiades in the Peloponnesian War, I thought, okay, I'm interested in the Peloponnesian War. Alcibiades uh, is an interesting person to, to frame this narrative about because you can't talk about everything in the Peloponnesian War. It's, it's, it's absolutely huge. It goes on for 30 years. Um, and I was really looking forward to this book and then was somewhat disappointed by it. So there's, there's a few choices that this book makes, um, which uh, initially I was disappointed with. And um, I, I think there could definitely be a more interesting book written about Alcibiades or about the Peloponnesian War. I think you could still do this as a historical novel, make it more interesting, maybe by maybe focusing less on the military aspect of it and focusing more on the personal drama and the politics of it. Of course, I say that because that's just me. That's what I'm interested in. I'm more interested in the personal drama and the politics. So this, in that respect, this was not the book I was looking for. Maybe somebody else who's more interested in the military aspect of it would enjoy this book more. Um, however, to, just to jump ahead to my final summation of this book, even though I was uh, disappointed by the first half of it, I think the second half of this book won me back. And definitely by the time I got to the end of it, I, I was glad I had read it. But it is a niche interest. Uh, if, if you are not particularly interested in the Peloponnesian War, I would not recommend picking this book up. Um, you, you know, there's, there's um, yeah, it, it's historical fiction. And I often think of historical fiction as a way for people who are not informed about history to get an easy introduction to history. That, that's, when I was in high school, that's how I learned a lot of my first history was reading historical novels ab about Rome. Um, 
So that that's what I tend to think of as the, the function of historical fiction. This book, however, it's historical fiction, but it's not a particularly easy introduction to the Peloponnesian War. I would be interested to hear what somebody who had no background in the Peloponnesian War would make of this book. Um, if Amazon and Goodreads are any indication, a lot of those people ended up not finishing this book. But um, if, if, if you're out there and this was the first book you read in the Peloponnesian War and you finished it, or even if you didn't finish it, let, let me know what you thought about it in, in the comments. I, I'd be curious. A Num number of the reviewers on Amazon's and Goodreads said you, you really want some background in the Peloponnesian War before reading this book, and they recommended... A couple of them recommended the Peloponnesian War by Donald Kagan, which I, I think is the, well, I, I, I shouldn't say best. It's the only book I've read. But it's, it's a very good introduction for, for the average person, uh, quite readable. But yeah, there, there are just so many aspects of the Peloponnesian War which are referenced in this book, but never explained. Uh, so why are they fighting the war at all? Uh, not explained. Uh, the first conflict is the Siege of Potidea, which is something I barely remember from Donald Kagan's book. It's, it's something that was technically within Athenian sphere of influence, so the siege of it was not technically a violation of their truce with Sparta, but it was, it was something that disturbed the Spartans, if I remember correctly. It's, it's some, the, the opening parts of this book... Uh, some of the opening parts of this book take place at the Siege of Potidea, but it's not explained why they're besieging it or what's going on. The Sicilian Expedition, uh, a lot of this book takes, is talking about the Sicilian Expedition, which was when one of Athen, Ath, sorry, Athens' allies invited them into Sicily to defend them against Syracuse. N never really explained in this book. Uh, they, they talk about uh, going to. They, they talk about. They, they talk a lot about the Sicilian expedition, but never really explain why they're there. Um, then uh, there much is made of the uh, what was it? I forget the name. There was a, a big political incident uh, where uh, some generals were uh, condemned to death. Uh, in Athens because they let some of the men drown during the sea battle. Here it is. Arginusai, Arginusai, I think is the name. Is that the name? Oh, no, no, no. Oh, sorry. Ar Arginusai is, uh, where, where was it? Okay. Uh, yeah. Sorry. S -s some, some controversy where a bunch of... Uh, Generals didn't rescue the men who were drowning at sea and uh, so got condemned to death themselves by the Athenian assembly, uh, which is, uh, again, referenced in here, but never really explained what the significance of that is. Um, what else is not explained? Uh, there, oh, the, the whole, the whole uh, oligarchic coup uh, and then the restoration of democracy uh, which is vaguely offhandedly referenced, but never really explained in here. Um, so I, I, I imagine this would be quite frustrating to somebody who, who didn't have a background. So uh, I would recommend this book if you're interested in the Peloponnesian War and you want to make a study of it, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend it as an introduction. Although, if let me know if you read this as an introduction. Uh, I would recommend, like other people do, that you either read it alongside Donald Kagan's book or you read Donald Kagan's book first and then this one. And I know that's going to put a lot of people off right off the bat. Um, so if you're not interested in the spirit and history, you're not interested in it. But if you want to make a serious study of it, or I, I guess this isn't so serious, if you want to make a, sort of a hobby of making a study out of it, uh, then these two books together would complement each other nicely. And this does um, add some interesting narrative uh, parts to uh, Donald Kagan's history and, and, and some interesting flair to some of the history that you'll pick up from that. 
So uh, I, I was recounting earlier the whole sordid saga of Alcibiades' story. Now, this is a novel of Alcibiades, but it's actually told from the perspective of a common soldier who, for various periods, falls under uh, Alcibiades' um, entourage. Uh, he's on the Sicilian expedition with Alcibiades and the rest of them. But then uh, at the very beginning of the Sicilian expedition, Alcibiades gets hauled back to Athens for uh, trial. And this is where Alcibiades flees to Sparta instead. Now, if I was writing this book, I think it would be interesting to follow Alcibiades into Sparta and get the whole drama there. Uh, you know, what's going through his head? Is he betraying his country or is he, he, is he just all about his own cult of ego? Uh, the, the whole soap opera thing with the King of Spartan's wife. Uh, that, that's what I'd be interested in. But that's not where the book goes. Instead, we stay in Sicily for I don't know how many pages. Uh, a good 100 pages or something. Uh, with the very depressing debacle, which was the Sicilian Expedition. So the Sicilian expedition was just a huge military disaster for Athens. It's, it's I, I think, been compared to at, like the American war in Vietnam, where they came into Sicily expecting to be greeted as liberators, did not understand what they were getting into. And this just got bogged down into this miserable uh, war of attrition um, where they ended up... It, in the end, after several months of hardship, just getting all captured and put into the slave mines. Uh, and, uh, you know, to be fair, it is all real history. Uh, Donald Kagan details these campaigns as well, but it's just so depressing to read. Um, and I really wanted to be where the more dramatic and soap opera, opera stuff was happening with Alcibiades. I didn't want to be stuck in this quagmire campaign in Sicily, but that, that's where the narrative takes us. Um, and it, it's really depressing to read. Uh, there's, there's a lot in this book that's depressing. Also, the plague in Athens, uh, which again is all historical, but it's, it's, it's this huge plague in Athens uh, during the Peloponnesian War, which wiped out, I don't know, like a quarter of the population or something. Uh, and... Um, we, we are, we spend a lot of time in the plague in Athens and the narrator talks about how his father catches the plague and his wife catches the plague and dies and his sister catches the plague and dies. Uh, and it, it's, the, 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 I mean, the narrator of this book really has such a depressing life. And, you know, I guess fair enough, the Peloponnesian War was a really depressing period of history. I was talking before about how interesting it was. But it was also a, a war that was not fun to fight in and was uh, a war that was famous for its atrocities uh, as well. Um, so I, I wanted to spend time with kind of the fun and zany parts of Alcibiades' uh, biography. But Stephen Pressfield is more interesting, uh, more interested in the depressing military quagmires of the Peloponnesian War. So that, that's where a lot of this novel takes us, especially in the first half. Near the second half, we, we spend more time with Alcibiades uh, himself. Um, I, I'm, I mentioned earlier that this author is apparently quite popular in military circles, and indeed... There is uh, an affection for soldiers' life here. Uh, when I was reading this, I, I mean, I knew he was popular in military circles uh, from Steve Donahue's videos. But when I was reading this, I was reading his description of military life. I thought, this sounds like somebody who has spent time in the military. Like, th this sounds like somebody who actually knows what he's talking about. So I went to his Wikipedia article, and sure enough, uh, he has spent time in the military, and I, th I think he, he must be drawing on those experiences. 
Uh, now, he did not, of course, spend time in the military of ancient Athens in 400 BC, but uh, I, I'm, I'm presuming uh, some of his knowledge of just human nature and camp conditions and what it's like to be out on campaign just, just must have transferred. Uh, either that or he's just a very good writer in that respect, because you, you definitely get a feeling of authenticity with the military parts. There's also a lot of battle scenes. Now, the battles confused me. Uh, I had a hard time. I, I, I could follow parts of it, but then I would just get lost. And I was like, wait, okay, wh where are they? Are, are they on the ships? Uh, who's, are, are, they, are they back on the land? W where did those horses come from? I, I just, I had a very hard time following his descriptions of everything that was happening in the battle. He would lose me for periods. And this is a complaint I frequently make when reading books, is that the, the action sequences I have difficulty following in my head. I, I have difficulty going from the, the words on the printed page to picturing what's happening in my mind. So this could just be me. And in fact, I went on to Goodreads and Amazon specifically to see if anyone else was complaining about the battle scenes being confusing. Now, people had a lot of complaints about this book. Uh, it, it, some people loved it, some people hated it. It seems to be one of those books. But as far as I could tell, nobody else was complaining about the battles. So it's just me, I guess. Uh, I, I had trouble following it. Now, that being said, I had, I had trouble following it in its entirety, but there were certain sequences in the battles where I could follow them. I, I'd, I'd follow it for a while and then I'd get lost for a while and then I'd follow it for a while and get lost for a while. The, the battle scenes tend to be quite long. They go on for several pages. The parts I could follow were really impressive. Uh, you, 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 uh, but again, you get a sense that the author has been there, that he, he's, he's been fighting in these uh, hoplite battles or been fighting in these naval battles in ancient Greece, which of course he hasn't. But he, he, he just gives the impression of somebody who has been through the horrors of ancient warfare. And it is not a glorified view of war at all. It, it, you, you get war in all its horrors when he's describing the, these armies clashing. Um, but you also get a sense of the spectacle of it all, especially the sea battles, the, these triremes ramming into each other, the, the throwing of the hooks and the, the fighting uh, to board one of the ships or defend one of your ships. Uh, it, it, it can be quite gripping stuff. And uh, again, I got confused sometimes, but when I wasn't confused, I was absorbed uh, in, in the in the pictures. Um, and, you, you know, uh, the, the there's a pull quote on the back of the book, and I, I know you have to be careful with that. Uh, but um, wh where is it? Oh, yeah, here, it's right at the front. Pressfield's battle scenes rank with the most convincing ever written. Apparently that's from USA Today. Uh, let's see. S somewhere in the battle, yeah. Uh, graphic and embracing descriptions of the land and naval battles. Uh, so uh, it, it is something apparently the critics have, have latched onto as well. Uh, and yeah, I don't know. Somebody else out there who's read this book, let me know. Was it just me? Am I the only one who found them a little bit confusing at times, the battle scenes? But when they were not confusing, they could be very gripping. Um, although horrifying. I mean, you, you, you get this, you, you know, descriptions of people getting their heads smashed and uh, the, all the, the brutality that must have come from that combat in such close quarters. Uh, like I said, this can be a bit of a depressing book to read sometimes. Um, now, the, the book, like I said, uh, is, 
kind of about Alcibiades, but Alcibiades is not our narrator. Actually, we, there's a bit of a interesting narrative structure. And again, this is something I saw people complaining about on Amazon and Goodreads. So the there's several narrators. There's It starts off with a character who's talking about his conversation with his grandfather. And his grandfather is narrating a series of conversations he had with Polymedes. So you've got the, the, I wouldn't call him the main character, but the introductory character who is talking to his grandfather. And the grandfather is relaying the conversations from Polymedes. And Polymedes is the one who interacts with Alcibiades. So you, you've got like three levels of narration before you even get to Alcibiades. People on Amazon and Goodreads were saying this was, uh, so, some people were saying this was unnecessarily complicated. Uh, and I think I might have to agree. I mean, when I first thought, when I first realized we were setting up a narrative structure with layers, I thought, oh, maybe this is going to be like Don Quixote. Because, you know, in Don Quixote, there's all these different layers of narration and the, 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 the different layers comment on the accuracy of the others. Um, but I don't, after setting that up, the, the author doesn't really do anything too inventive or subversive with that. It's just simply a way to just relay the information. I, I think I understand why he does it, because uh, Alcibiades uh, is, uh, the author doesn't want a narration that's too close to Alcibiades. He, he doesn't want like an Alcibiades first person narration. Partly one, because Alcibiades in this story is, is best preserved more as an enigma. And partly two, the, one of the whole points of this story is the incredible cult of personality that was around Alcibiades. And that is best observed by somebody on the outside. Uh, somebody uh, not by Alcibiades himself, but somebody who can see the way the city is reacting to Alcibiades. Um, so that that's why it's not Alcibiades himself, but his, his the the common soldier who's narrating it. As for the necessity of putting in the other two layers of narration, uh, certainly the the grandfather character will occasionally interject to put in some of the background uh, to the Peloponnesian War that uh, the, the the common soldier character is not able to provide because he's off. He's off in campaign somewhere, and then there's something going on going on somewhere else. Although, like I said at the beginning of this review, not as much background is given as could be wished for. Uh, the reader unfamiliar with uh, a lot of this history is kind of left out to dry, as I said at the beginning of the review. Um, so, yeah. I'm a little bit on the fence on it, but... I think I'm going to have to side with what other people on Amazon and Goodreads have been saying. The complicated narrative structure is unnecessary and the book could have been more streamlined in that regard. Um, as I mentioned, the second half of the book is uh, less depressing than the first half and we get more time with Alcibiades in the second half of the book. So... Uh, I mean, the first half of the book, I thought, what, why, why am I even reading this? I, I, I want to be reading about the wacky adventures of Alcibiades. I don't want to be dragged down in this depressing Sicilian expedition. Uh, but then the second half of the book, uh, I found, was much more interesting. I read somebody, I forget who this was, either on Amazon or Goodreads, said I almost stopped reading in the first half, but I persevered. To the end and I'm glad I did because the book comes together at the end uh, it comes together in the second half rather and I, I think that's me as well uh, was kind of wondering why I was reading it in the first half thought it was much improved in the second half and on the whole I'm glad I read it uh, although I I still think there, um, 
is a better novel to be written out there or a more engaging novel to be read, written out there about Alcibiades and the Peloponnesian War, something that focuses more on the soap opera aspects of it, something that focuses more on Alcibiades' wacky adventures, something that maybe focuses more on the political drama in Athens uh, as opposed to the, the military campaigns. Um, but that's what I'm interested in. If you're interested more in a lot of the military aspects of it, then, then you'll enjoy this book more. All right, that's all for me.